Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Bland, and I'm the uh, president and founder of the Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute. And I'd like to raise a, uh, what I think is probably a serious question with you for a moment. If you're at all interested in the evolution of medicine, of healthcare, how decisions are made, what evidence is required to make a decision, how does the standard of identity change over time, this is a big one I'm going to share with you. So hold tight, keep yourself strapped in, and don't get too upset too quickly. Let me go through the topic. So I want to start with uh, the most singularly most used in the English language uh, that's applied to healthcare. And you know what that is? It's the word stress. And how did that word stress get in the lexicon of medicine and physiology? When it was really born out of physics, stress and strain, mechanical issues, and yet somehow we associate it so strongly with physiology. And it's a common used term, not just in the trade, in the medical field, but across all sectors of our society, people are familiar with an understanding of what stress means in physiology. Well, as you know, the person who appropriated that term for physics over into physiology in the late 30s, 1930s, was a physiologist uh, working in the early days of endocrinology uh, at McGill University in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada, uh, Dr. Hans Selye. And his um, science and history is legendary in the field. And it's interesting to note, isn't it, that this individual who coined a term and built a concept within physiology, the so-called general adaptation syndrome, and gave rise to an understanding of stress-related disorders that had never before been understood, never won a Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine. Why? Why? with a person that made that contribution. And that leads me into a topic that I, I hope you'll appreciate, how discoveries are made and how they gain stickiness and, and become part of the guild. And I want to use the term guild because sometimes this field of science and medicine is a guild. You got to be a member of the club. So when I think of Hans Selye and I go to the history, I'm led back into many books that have recorded his year, his years of experience and contributions up through the 60s and the 1970s and the magnificent uh, legacy he left to us. But one of the books which really struck me in reading about his uh, life and history was a book called The Stress Myth. The Stress Myth. Uh, Science and Humanities Press in 2000 after his death. So recounting in 287 pages what they consider to be the myth of his discovery. That Stress really is not a physiologically hardcore term, that he never was fully um, cloistered by the scientific field in which he operated in. He didn't uh, have the level of evidentiary support that was necessary to fully prove his hypothesis. And therefore, we somehow should question the importance of Hans Selye and his contributions to medicine and physiology. There's always these downing individuals, aren't there, in science and medicine. So how did that happen and why did it happen? Well, it's been purported that the reason that occurred and why Selye never got full respect for his contributions was that he never allowed himself to be a member of the guild. He worked kind of outside the scientific and medical guild. He did his work in his laboratory. Uh, he then had the audacity to write consumer books that were describing the physiology of stress and consumer language. And he took it around the science and medical community to the direct consumer. And that was like uh, the kiss of death for him scientifically, that he uh, never was validated then as a member of the guild. And so his methods, uh, although they stuck and they've created huge change, uh, he never got the accreditation uh, that he deserved. So how does this play out today? Uh, let's move from stress to a companion issue, and that is another neurologically related condition, which are called neurodegenerative diseases. And let's move to a more recent discussion, not the, uh, the book in 2000 written uh, about Hans Selye and the supposed myth of uh, stress, but let's move to pseudo-medicine, the article discussing uh, the rise of other ways of approaching neurodegenerative diseases, particularly Alzheimer's. And I'm uh, struck when I read this editorial that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association more recently, this is um, in the February 12th issue of 2019, the title of which is The Rise of Pseudomedicine for Dementia and Brain Health, in which the 
investigator authors of this uh, editorial who are all faculty members at the University of California San Francisco School of Medicine in the Neurology Department took umbrage and, and uh, strong criticism of anyone who would take to the general public directly uh, approaches that would be considered out-of-the-box thinking related to the prevention and management of uh, neurodegenerative d disorders including Alzheimer's. And in fact, I would say that this particular article is, uh, to use the word scathing, would almost be an understatement. It's a very, very critical, and I won't even quote some of the verbiage because I don't want to give it credit, but suffice it to say that the conclusions they derive is that one needs to be very cautious of self-reported cures and, and uh, without hard science and proof of concept that we should not uh, get people too um, excited about or raise their expectations that there are approaches that could be used for reduction in their incidence or, or severity of neurodegeneration that are outside the, uh, the bounds of traditional medical neurological therapies. Now, with that in mind as a context, let me give you some other thoughts <laughs> that might relate to this. So I'm now going to go to the New England Journal of Medicine. Most of us would say that that's a very highly respected uh, uh, internationally uh, regarded uh, medical journal. And I'm going to now uh, quote from the April 11th, 2019 issue of this uh, issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, in which there were uh, two papers back-to-back -back, uh, published uh, concerning a, new, a test of a new drug uh, for the uh, potential treatment of Alzheimer's. So this is uh, moving into phase two, phase three clinical trial work. These are beta secretase inhibiting drugs and uh, which are known, by the way, to, at least in the animal studies and in some uh, in vitro work, to lower uh, amyloid deposition, assuming that these amyloid plaques, these neurofibrillary plaques uh, that are associated with amyloid plaque deposition uh, are the, uh, the causative agents for Alzheimer's disease. So if you could find a, a silver bullet or a gold or platinum bullet that went directly in and blocked amyloid production, beta amyloid, that you could then prevent and even treat. Uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so there are many, many different companies uh, in drug development that are focusing on different ways of blocking these, uh, these pathways, these uh, specific approaches towards what are con is considered uh, the idiopathology of Alzheimer's. And so what um, the editorial that, fo that follows these two papers that are published in the New England Journal of Medicine talk about is the fact that uh, neither of these uh, studies showed clinical success. Not only did they not show clinical success, but the patients got worse on the drugs. Now that's like the kiss of death, right? You spend a billion dollars developing a drug to treat a condition only to find that the drug that you're using makes the condition worse. Now why would that be? They go on to offer a potential explanation because in this editorial they, they show that there are many different ways that these uh, injuries that are associated with hippocampal injury associated with Alzheimer's disease might occur. It's just not a, like a one uh, route to Alzheimer's. There may be multiple ideological contributors and therefore maybe just blocking one thing uh, has an untoward effect on other things that produces not a benefit but a risk. And in fact, uh, maybe we are using a different or uh, wrong model. Maybe our model should be looking at multiple hits across multiple things to create a symphonic orchestration of the dysfunction that we call Alzheimer's rather than thinking there's a single cause for this single name disease because maybe it's a multimodal disease. So that's really the New England Journal of Medicine saying, isn't it too bad that this is just another of the multiple trials that have been uh, done at great expense that have demonstrated failure in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease based upon this single hit target model of pharmacology. Hmm. Well, what do we do about that? Well, that leads to another paper in this uh, interesting litany of recent papers. This is from the Journal of the American Medical Association. Now I'm in the April 2nd, 2019 issue. And what in, in this uh, issue was a very interesting paper entitled Amyloid Protein Emission Tomography or PET Scanning and Changes in the Clinical Management of Patients with Cognitive Impairment. Now this is a new technology uh, that's been developed, radiological uh, intervention that allows for the evaluation of different uh, uh, anatomical structures in the brain, one of which is uh, uh, looking at um, uh, potential amyloid deposition in certain portions of the brain. And what they find is that uh, looking at hippocampal volume and looking at uh, 
uh, amyloid deposition that maybe you can start to actually understand early on uh, uh, features of the disorder that allow intervention much earlier uh, than waiting till you get serious uh, etiopathology that we call Alzheimer's. And in fact, in the last uh, part of this uh, paragraph uh, of the summary, they, uh, they say, ultimately, the hope in the management will include access to pathophysiologically appropriate disease-modifying interventions. Disease-modifying, pathophysiologically focused, which may be complex in their uh, their mechanism of action, not just single hit. And in fact, if you look at the association of amyloid positron, uh, positron emission tomography with the progression of disease, you'll find maybe you could look at multiple factor, factorial um, multimodal interventions at a much earlier stage than just a single hit technology looking at late stage disease. Okay, interesting. Now where does that take us? How does that relate to Hans Selye? Where are we today? Well, I think if we're honest, we would say that the billions of dollars that have been spent by pharmaceutical companies to date to develop drugs to treat Alzheimer's based upon a single hit mentality with a single target has been uniformly unsuccessful. Not only unsuccessful, but even in some cases, as I just talked about, creating worse outcome than the patients that did nothing. So what's the alternative? And the alternative leads us into a Hanselier-like argument that without all the evidence that we might want from a placebo randomized clinical control approach towards one agent against one disease, there is evidence accumulating that this multimodal disease called Alzheimer's may need a multimodal approach for its treatment. And where is this born? This born, is born out of a number of individuals, but the champion of this, of course, is the author of the book, The End of Alzheimer's, a well-known neuro neuroscientist who has published uh, literally hundreds of papers, uh, working at the Buck Institute at UCLA at Alzheimer's uh, Research, and, uh, and also, interestingly enough, at the University of California, San Francisco Medical School, the exact same medical school where the critics were talking about pseudomedicine and cognitive impairment. And what has this individual, Dr. Dale Bredesen, found? He's found that maybe a multimodal approach to a multimodal disorder called Alzheimer's would be the preferential way of approaching it. And you would need to personalize the, uh, the approach based upon the functional implications it had on the patient. Now, when you get into multimodal approaches against a multimodal disease, it's going to become very complicated to do a single target intervention uh, based upon a, a traditional randomized clinical control trial against a placebo. So you're going to have to have new evidence-based information, some of which is going to be nested case history, some of which is going to be observational, some of which is going to be uh, holding some variables constant and, and others that can be varied. Uh, going to be a variety of different data, meta-analysis, uh, uh, animal work, and, and mechanistic studies, and so forth, all of which has to be accumulated together into a body of knowledge that someone can get their minds and hands around to understand how to personalize the program. And that is what Dr. Bredesen has done. And so in, um, in 2014, he authored what I consider to be a landmark and, and somewhat controversial paper entitled Reversal of Cognitive Decline, a Novel Therapeutic Program, which is a multimodal approach towards a multimodal condition using lifestyle intervention, personalized therapy, based on over 30 different principles that might lead to risk based upon the types of data, the evidence that I was describing across a wide variety of studies, clinical intervention trials of, of open source, um, observational work, animal work, mechanistic studies. Well, that was followed up then uh, in 2015 uh, with another paper published uh, by Dr. Bredesen entitled Metabolic Profiling Distinguishes Three Subtypes of Alzheimer's Disease in which he was able to start differentiating different uh, idiophenotypes that would then maybe be uh, candidates for different types of multimodal personalized intervention. And again, reporting this and, and doing it in such a way as to uh, bring both the science and evidence together for uh, both discussion, knowing at worst uh, intervention would do no harm because these are principally lifestyle intervention personalized therapies. And then more recently, and most recently, a third paper in this sequence, uh, which is actually a clinical nested uh, series of case histories of individuals who had actually been approached by this personalized uh, intervention, multimodal intervention, 
uh, the, the Bredesen Protocol, as it's often been labeled. And this is entitled Reversal of Cognitive Decline in Alzheimer's Disease, actually uh, showing a variety of case histories of positive outcome, some truly remarkable of people who were functionally so um, uh, depreciated that they were unable to uh, be involved with uh, activities of daily living, which after intervention uh, re resumed daily living, sometimes even getting back to where they were driving their car once again, going back to work, uh, really remarkable case histories. Acknowledging that this is not a randomized clinical control trial, acknowledging that this is fraught with the uncertainty of uh, nested case histories and, and, and cross-platform studies uh, in, many, in multiple clinical centers. But the most important thing is that the clinical proof of concept, which is outcome, seems to point in a direction that maybe this is where therapies ought to be found. Does this sound at all like Ancelier and the development of the stress concept in which it was not yet clinically proven by randomized clinical controlled trials. He took it outside the guild and went to the direct public. He started talking about it and training people and trying to get them to really understand the importance of stress as a mitigator to many chronic diseases. This is a similar theme. And so I asked the question, how do we as a culture adopt new information and make it part of the standards of care and to really uh, uh, gain traction and, and get it uh, in such a way that individuals uh, will lose their fear that if they do something different from that of their colleagues, they're not going to be exercised from the community. I think we do so by the strength of rational thinking. We do so through the innovation and leadership of a few. We do so when individuals are willing to put themselves in harm way and bring their ideas out and have it tested by others and show whether it's valid. We do so by leadership, like Dr. Bredesen has demonstrated. So I think this is a very interesting model example of what I call the cellier phenomena as to how ideas ultimately gain traction against the convention of the guild that sometimes already has a vested interest they're trying to protect. Interesting thought.